All right, so um, you synced over some really fascinating stuff about Shakespeare's Cymbeline, and we're going to dive into this theory that could completely change how we see the play. We're talking about the idea that someone else entirely might have written it, Christopher Marlowe. Yeah. What's fascinating about this video from Bastian Conrad is it focuses on Cymbeline to explore the Shakespeare authorship question. Um, this play doesn't usually take center stage in these debates, so that's kind of unique. Yeah, it definitely is. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, Cymbeline is one of Shakespeare's later romances. It's got like everything, a king, a wicked stepmother trying to off her stepdaughter, a wrongly banished husband, and just tons of mistaken identities. Classic Shakespearean drama, right? Yeah, absolutely. But remember, for centuries, there's been this debate about whether William Shakespeare from Stratford-upon-Avon actually wrote all the works that are attributed to him. This video dives into that, specifically arguing that Christopher Marlowe, a playwright who supposedly died in 1593, wrote Cymbeline under the pseudonym Shakespeare. And what really caught my eye with this video is they're saying there's evidence hidden within Cymbeline itself. They focus on the character of Posthumus, saying he's basically a stand-in for Marlowe's own life after faking his death. To understand this, we need a little background on Marlowe. Um, he was known for his incredible plays, but he was also quite controversial. You know, rebellious views, accusations of atheism, the whole bit. So some theorists propose that he might have faked his death to escape all that. That's where the video draws a parallel to Posthumus, who goes through exile, banishment, and even returns after everyone thinks he's dead. It really does mirror the idea of Marlowe going into hiding. And if you dig into Act 5 of Cymbeline, Posthumus even has this dream where he's surrounded by family and Jupiter predicts he'll end his miseries and flourish in peace and plenty. So it's like the video suggesting that even though Marlowe is dead to the world, he's still secretly living and writing. That's one interpretation. The video even takes it further, pointing out that the name Posthumus literally means born after the death of the father. Could this be a hidden clue that Marlowe was living under a new identity? Okay, that's really making me think. And then there's that intense scene in Act 5, Scene 4, where Posthumus is literally awaiting execution. Which the video connects to the theory of Marlowe faking his death. You know, it wasn't unheard of in those times to use substitute bodies, so they suggest that maybe Marlowe pulled a fast one and staged the whole thing. The video even brings up the Queen's monologue in Act 1, Scene 6, where she's going on about Posthumus's misfortunes. They interpret that as Marlowe pouring his own feelings of loss and exile into the play. Yeah, if Marlowe were truly living in hiding, you can imagine the psychological and emotional toll that would take. It's interesting to consider whether those feelings might have found their way into Cymbeline. I'm already seeing this play in a whole new light, but hold on, the video doesn't stop there. They go on to compare Cymbeline to another Shakespeare play, Hamlet, both of them explore these themes of betrayal, revenge, and like the very nature of humanity. All things that Marlowe, if he were living this secret life, might have been grappling with himself. Really food for thought. You know, before we get too deep into the evidence, I think it's important to remember that this is just one interpretation of Cymbeline. What really stands out to you so far in this whole Marlowe theory? For me, it's the potential for a play to be this coded message about the author's hidden life. The video's analysis of those specific scenes, like Posthumus's dream and the Queen's speech, that's what really grabs my attention. But there's a lot more to unpack here. Absolutely. Let's dive into the next layer of this theory and see where it leads us. So let's delve a little deeper into this evidence for Marlowe's fake death. The video spends a lot of time unpacking Act 5, Scene 4, where Posthumus is in Proven, and specifically his kind of strange conversation with the jailer. Yeah. I remember thinking that scene was a bit odd. The jailer's asking if Posthumus is like ready to die and he says he's over roasted like he was ready long ago. The video is claiming this is a subtle hint about Marlowe staging his death. Yeah, what's interesting is that the video points to the jailer's lines about a heavy reckoning and tavern bills as like deliberate references to the place where Marlowe supposedly died a tavern in Deptford. It's as if those seemingly mundane lines are actually like packed with hidden meaning. And then there's that line from the jailer about a penny cord that sums up a thousand in a trice of what's past, is, and to come. That sounds pretty symbolic, right? Right. The video interprets that penny cord representing the hangman's noose as a symbol of Marlowe escaping his old life and leaving behind all those thousand things from his past. I'm starting to see how the video is weaving together all these seemingly random lines into a theory about Marlowe faking his death. But how does the substitute corpse thing fit into all of this? Well, the video cleverly connects this back to another Shakespeare play, Measure for Measure. There's a character in that play, Barnardine, 
who was already hanged a day earlier, and his body is used as a stand-in for the protagonist, Claudio. So the video is proposing that Marlowe might have used a similar strategy, substituting someone else's body to make it look like he had died. Exactly. And they even name a possible candidate. A historical figure named John Penry, who is documented as being hanged just a day before Marlowe supposedly died. It's a pretty bold claim, suggesting that Penry's body could have been the substitute. Definitely a lot to take in, but this whole idea is making me question everything I thought I knew about Cymbeline. And the video doesn't stop there. They also highlight the significance of the name Leonidas, which is another name for posthumous in the play. They argue that this name could be a play on the word neonate, meaning newborn. So yet another hint that Marlowe was living under a new identity. And remember how the play describes posthumous as a lion's whelp. In Act 1, it's as if they're drawing a connection between the lion, a symbol of power and strength, and the idea of Marlowe being reborn after his supposed death. Yeah, it's all about finding those hidden meanings and connections. Now let's go back to the Queen's monologue in Act 1, Scene 6. She's trying to convince her daughter Imogen that Posthumus is finished, that his future is bleak. And the video interprets her words as Marlowe's own feelings about his situation exiled, unable to speak openly, and facing a seemingly hopeless future. What's really interesting is how the video takes those seemingly innocuous lines from the Queen and interprets them as like potential clues about Marlowe's secret life. It's like they're mm -hmm. saying, look closer, there's more to this than meets the eye. This whole deep dive is making me see Cymbeline in a completely different way. And the video keeps building its case by suggesting that Cymbeline is actually more about Marlowe's inner turmoil than anything else. They even compare it to Hamlet, another play full of introspection and melancholy. That's a key point. The video argues that both plays reflect the state of mind someone like Marlowe might have been in, living in hiding, unable to claim his own work, and struggling with feelings of loss and betrayal. It's definitely a thought-provoking argument. This video is really weaving together all these historical details, character analysis, and close readings of the text to make a really compelling case for Marlowe's authorship. Yeah, and it's important to remember that the video acknowledges that this is a controversial theory. They're not claiming to have definitive proof, but they're encouraging viewers to like think critically about the evidence and be open to different possibilities. Right. It all comes back to that idea that the Shakespeare authorship problem has so many different interpretations. But before we go any further down this rabbit hole, let's pause and ask, what does this all mean for us? Why should we care about this theory, even if we're not Shakespeare scholars? That's a great question. This whole deep dive into Cymbeline and the Marlowe theory is about more than just figuring out who wrote the play. It's about challenging our assumptions and looking at literature in a new way. It's like we're being invited to become literary detectives, searching for hidden clues and deeper meanings in the text. Whether or not you buy into the Marlowe theory, this video definitely encourages us to engage with Cymbeline in a more critical and inquisitive way. Absolutely. It's about asking questions, exploring different perspectives, and realizing that there might be much more to these plays than we initially thought. You know, this is really making me think about other works of literature. Could there be hidden messages embedded in other plays and novels? It's so exciting to think about the possibilities. It really is. And the video has even more to say about Cymbeline and how its themes connect to Marlowe's supposed life after faking his death. Are you ready to dig into the final layer of this theory? Absolutely. Let's see where this deep dive takes us next. Okay, so we've been exploring this theory that Cymbeline is like a giant puzzle box, and if you know how to look, you can see these reflections of Christopher Marlowe's life hidden within it. But I'm still a bit fuzzy on how exactly the video connects all the dots. Yeah, they use this technique called parallelism, which basically means drawing connections between two separate things by highlighting their similarities. In this case, it's about linking events and themes in Cymbeline to events in Marlowe's alleged life after he faked his death. So, for example, Posthumus being banished is parallel to Marlowe going into exile. Ah, uh, so it's not just about finding direct references to Marlowe in the text, but rather seeing these broader thematic connections that reflect his supposed situation. Exactly. It's about reading between the lines. The video also dives deep into the play's language and imagery, looking for these hidden meanings. There's this one passage where Posthumus describes his outward sorrow as a thing too bad for bad report. And the video is interpreting that as Marlowe hinting at the fact that his public image, that bad report of his death, doesn't reflect the truth of his inner life. It's like he's saying, hey, there's more to this story than what people believe. Right. 
And there's another line where Posthumus describes himself as like this unique individual. He says that if you were to search the entire world for someone like him, there would be something failing in him that should compare. So the video reads that as Marlowe suggesting he's one of a kind, even if he has to keep his true identity a secret. It's really a fascinating way to interpret those lines. It makes you wonder if like every word was carefully chosen to convey some hidden message. Yeah, it's all about adding those layers of interpretation. And the video doesn't stop there. They also draw a parallel between Posthumus' eventual redemption in the play and Marlowe's supposed attempt to rebuild his life under a new identity. So both Posthumus and Marlowe in this interpretation are seeking forgiveness and a second chance, even though they've been wrongly accused and cast out. Exactly. It's a really powerful connection that adds another dimension to this whole theory. I have to say, this deep dive has really opened my eyes to a new way of looking at Cymbeline. You know, the video makes a strong argument for Marlowe's authorship, but are there any counter arguments or criticisms of this whole theory? Well, the biggest hurdle for any alternative authorship theory is the lack of concrete, irrefutable proof. While the video offers some really intriguing interpretations and connections, there's no smoking gun that definitively proves Marlowe wrote Cymbeline or any other Shakespeare play. So in the end, it all comes down to interpretation. Some people might find these connections totally convincing, while others might see them as just coincidences or stretches. Exactly. And that's what makes the Shakespeare authorship problem so fascinating. It's an ongoing debate that invites us to engage with these plays on a deeper level, to think critically, and to question everything we thought we knew. This entire deep dive has definitely sparked a desire in me to go back and reread Cymbeline. I'm going to be looking for those hidden layers of meaning, trying to decipher the puzzle for myself. Yeah, I encourage you to do the same. And as you read or watch the play, consider this. If Marlowe truly were the author, writing in secret and fear, what other messages might he have woven into the text? What other secrets might be waiting to be uncovered? Wow, that's a fantastic thought. This deep dive has been a wild ride, full of intrigue, mystery, and some serious literary detective work. It just goes to sh even in works we think we know well, there's always something new to discover. You got it. The world of literature is full of hidden depths and endless possibilities. So keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep diving deep.